Here we are. Welcome. <laughs> I am Elisa Martinez. I am the founder of Little With Great Love. I want to welcome you to our final talk in our Saints of the Sacred Heart series. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Caitlin, for being here. She is our dear friend, our editor, and our speaker for this evening on St. Margaret Mary Alaco. I, I think we're saying it right, right? <laughs> I don't become friends with French saints. Uh-oh. <laughs> they don't know how to pronounce their names. <laughs> they live in these fancy cities. We, we enjoy their food, though, right? I mean... Some of it. <laughs> I'm partial to German Polish. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we can, we can work that in. Uh, if you are watching this later on YouTube, we thank you so much. And this is a replay of a three-part series um, from Little With Great Love. So you can check out the other two videos um, in this series on Sister Josepha Menendez, who I talked about, um, and our first talk, and St. Gertrude the Great, who Alyssa talked about last week. And that was a great fun. So Thank you guys so much. Um, Alyssa's going to be in the chat box over there. And hi, Albert. Thanks for joining us from Malta. That's awesome. <laughs> so we're going to dive in and start talking all things St. Margaret Mary. Look, why don't you kick us off here? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about this uh, beloved French saint, right? Born in 1647. <laughs> so like a little bit after the Reformation. Okay. But in a historical context, not very far. <laughs> yeah, um, she was a visitation nun, and like from her earliest memory, she has like this intense relationship with Jesus, where she's very aware of his presence in her life and how he's working. And she talks about how she remembers, like she made a vow of perpetual chastity, and she didn't know at the time what the word vow or perpetual chastity meant but she remembers saying these things during the elevations at mass <laughs> wow. and it's like wow. throughout this and this is the book it's her autobiography it's really small compared to the other two <laughs> <laughs> right if you, if you missed also, before yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so from a very young age, she had just a beautiful kind of relationship with the Lord, huh? I mean, he would speak to her, he, um, like, during Mass, or was it just, like, any... Um, it seems like it was most intensely like, during Mass and Adoration. Like, she talks about how her first communion, like, she was nine, and like, she had nothing in the world after she received communion satisfied her, and she would like try to join in the games of her friends but like she just felt this call to go away and pray and she would prostrate herself during prayer or kneel like with her bare knees on the ground and that was the only thing that gave her peace and joy <laughs> wow so very devout from a young age and we were drawing that comparison to sister josepha menendez who i spoke on in the first that from a you know, the Lord really kind of called them to himself um, from their youth. So, wow, that's remarkable. Um, to, did she then feel like the call to the religious life from from an early age? She, did. she was at a convent school and she says that she wanted to do what the nuns were doing because she would see them going around doing their nun things, whatever they were doing. <laughs> But she got sick, which prevented her from entering religious life. And then she had to leave the school for a little while. But during her sickness, she made a consecration to Mary, promising that if Mary cured her, Margaret Mary would one day be one of her daughters. And then she was cured. But she talks about how like she immediately fell into vanity because she was so excited about her freedom after her cure that... <laughs> But like she says that, and it's like reading what she's doing, it doesn't seem like she really fell into vanity. It just seems like she felt like she fell into vanity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So maybe our concept of it and hers were different, right? Yeah. Well, in the prophets, it talks about how, like with these saints, like especially saints that have a strong devotion to the Sacred Heart, it's like. Well, it says the divine light penetrates the souls of saints. 
it sheds such clear rays that they discover what they be what they call big sins, where we can only see the smallest imperfections or the simple faults of human weakness. So it's that, it's that like the light of Christ light is so Christ intense, is intense for them, and they're used to living in it. Yeah, and we're not used to that. Yeah. Okay. So that's a that's a great spiritual insight then in terms of um, I think the path to sanctity, you know, and stuff, especially because of their intense relationship and their, and how young they were. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that it, it it's like the Lord chose them to be on this like path to sanctity where it reveals these type of things to them. And it, it, it seems like there's such huge things where to us, like you said, I mean, they're, they're probably things that we may not even perceive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. So and then in her youth and, uh, and, and how did her kind of vocation come about? A lot of suffering. Lot of suffering. <laughs> 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 but it was, it was like after, after she was sick, sick, she lived with these relatives and she talks she about what she calls the state of captivity. captivity. Mm. And, and it's also so like, she's so forgiving of them. And it seems like she was even in the moment, like Jesus was uniting her with his heart at the moment of his passion when he was forgiving the good thief. And she says, I do not wish to blame those persons by what I am about to say, nor do I think they did any wrong in causing me to suffer. My God did not permit me to have this thought, but wished that I should regard them as instruments employed by him for the accomplishment of his will. So like everything was under lock and key. She couldn't find things to put on in order to go to mass. So she had to borrow. I don't know who she borrowed it from, but she talks about having to borrow a hat. <laughs> and then like, she would be so upset that she couldn't get to mass or adoration that she would cry. And then they didn't believe that she was crying because she was devout and wanted to go to mass. They thought she was sneaking out to see young, young men. Oh. But she says, I had such a horror in my heart for anything of that kind that I would rather have tested to see my body torn into a thousand pieces than entertain such a thought. Wow. (laughs) So at the age where girls are boy crazy and wanting to, it's not the case. (laughs) Yeah. She just wants to go spend hours in adoration. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's remarkable. So she knew she had the call pretty early, huh? Like for but she didn't want to be seen praying. Like she talks about how that was a martyrdom. If anybody ever caught her actually praying. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so that talk about vanity seems uh kind of funny because it, it yeah (laughs) it sounds like she has great humility but then maybe that was kind of a stumbling block for her probably because like she sees her humility compared with jesus infinite humility Mm. because of that union with his heart yeah yeah so tell us a little bit more about uh this union then well, her mother became very sick, and she was praying. I don't remember what happened after she prayed. Oh, yeah, her mother was healed. <laughs> <laughs> but she had, like, this huge boil on her cheek that burst, and it smelled so bad that nobody else would go into the room. But Margaret Mary was so strengthened by the prayer she had been praying for her mother's healing that she was the one person who took care of her and she would scrape away the flesh. Oh. Yeah. 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 She expected her mom to recover, but she did. Wow. She was a great intercessor already on earth. Yeah. It's remarkable. And then they tried to get her to marry. They did? Yes. Yes. What happened? It was partly her relatives and also her mom kept telling her that 
Like she needed to marry so that she could die in peace, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, like Margaret Mary was her only child, I think. So like having her settled was important, especially at that time. So I don't remember how everything exactly went down. I know she she became a visitation nun. Yeah. No, in her area there were the Holy Marys, and they really wanted her to join and made her promise that when she left the visitation nuns, because there was no way she was going to last there, that she would come back and join the Holy Marys. <laughs> <laughs> oh they had it out they well they wanted her right so they were like yeah you're not gonna uh, that's interesting i wonder if the visitation nuns were like our hardcore order or something like that for them or they just were a little bit like they were yeah yeah but it was it was i know margaret mary she said that she she did a bunch of different orders or she heard about a lot of them but as soon as she heard about the visitation nuns like her heart Felt like it was at home there and as soon as she walked into the monastery jesus told her that this was where he wanted her to be mm. so he led her there yes she was at peace she was at peace uh -huh. okay yeah so when, as she was there at the order um she had started to have visions before she joined or her vision started it seems like she had visions before she joined, but it's more that she was like so aware of Jesus being with her that I'm not sure if like physically appeared to her before she entered. Yeah, but definitely after she took vows, like, there was a different intensity to those visions. Mm -hmm. And that's when like you get her more famous visions where Jesus. Like physically appears when she sees his heart and she sees his wounds. Wow. So a after she joined the order, um, the, that's when the Lord started to explain to her, is it kind of like this, what happened with Josepha, that he had this mission for her? Like, Yeah, it's, yeah, it's he wanted, he his, wanted heart his heart to be heart known. Yeah, he makes that very clear to her, and but he's calling her to make his heart known, and she's very resistant to that because she doesn't want to be known. Like in the yeah. beginning of this book, like over and over again, she's talking about that resistance where she didn't want to write this. Yeah, <laughs> but her spiritual director he made her write it down. <laughs> yeah. And then, and I'm sure the Lord too, right? I mean, they they both were tell, instructing her to do that, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Did uh, did others know what was going on besides her spiritual director? Did uh, anybody else? I know later they find out that she was having these visions, and I know she probably told her superior yeah. while it was happening. Yeah. It was probably required to tell. Yeah. But. but like she hated to talk about this and to have people know she would even like she tried to forget herself so that she couldn't even relay the information. Wow. <laughs> I'm sure that did not work well. No, because no. Jesus no. remembered it all. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I think that that reluctance is very human. That element of humanity that comes into it, and I think that God chose these saints for that reason, partly too, because I think that if he, he knows the hearts of those that he's calling, and if they would become too uh, attached to it, if they, you know, if they had that type of desire to be known and renowned I th it could be too e you could be too easily swept up into it and, and then it becomes about the saint instead of it's about jesus you know um that's what i noticed from you know our little our little friends here and, and i think it's, it's the same right that she just had this well, the reluctance isn't just like, well, I don't, I don't want to tell people about you, Jesus. That's not what it's about. You know, it's just about, I don't, I don't want to be known. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> the, 
just had this desire to live like just this hidden life, right? Yeah, at one point she talks about how all she wanted to do was go out and live in the woods, and that was when she was really little. But she was afraid. The only thing that stopped her from doing that was that she might run into men. (laughs) (laughs) So she would have been perfectly content to just live all alone with Jesus and to never be known by anybody. But he, he raises her up to this vocation. Yeah. That's what he does with little saints. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So tell us a little bit about her visions with him. In one of the earlier ones, oh, this is my favorite one. (laughs) She's she's just sitting, I think this is during, she calls it the Octave of the Blessed Sacrament. I'm not sure what that is because we don't have that on our calendar. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But but he says, my divine heart is so inflamed with love for men, and for thee in particular, that being unable any longer to contain within itself the flames of its burning charity, it must needs spread them abroad by thy means, and manifest itself to them, mankind, in order to enrich them with the precious treasures which I discover in thee and which contain graces of sanctification and salvation necessary to withdraw them from the abyss of perdition. And then after he tells her this, he asks her for her heart, and she's like begging him to take her heart at the same time. And he places it in his own heart. And like within his heart, he shows her that her heart is like a little atom being consumed in a great furnace. And then he takes out her heart. And it's like a burning flame that's in the form of a heart. And he returns it to her. Wow. That sounds so much like Joseph do. I mean, he did. He took her heart and then sparked it and he gave it back. I mean, just the way the the same kind of um, desire for union with them, right? Mm-hmm. Like this... Uh, I want your heart. I'm giving you my heart. I want you to share my heart with others. I'm sharing my heart with you. I mean, because it's, it's that desire for intimacy and love and, and closeness, right? Mm-hmm. Wow. Like that, like that image of the sacrament of marriage too. Yeah. Where it's like this one heart union and you're supposed to become one heart. Yeah. But that's like, it's true whether it's holy matrimony or whether your spouse to Jesus. Right. Right. And he's showing them that right through this, through this intimacy and even the way that he speaks to them as, you know, his spouse and as his beloved, I mean, he's, he addresses them in in this way. Mm -hmm. Profound. Yeah. Like of of kind of letting them know of this mystical union that they have. (laughs) Romantic. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> romance and Alyssa, Alyssa was getting into that last week too you know talking about that um, yeah wow. then one of the most famous visions is I think it was Jesus on the cross I can't remember if he was on the cross or if he was just standing before her but like she sees that his five wounds are burning and she says they're burning like so many suns flames issued from every part of his sacred humanity especially from his adorable bosom, which resembled an open furnace and disclosed to me his most loving and most amiable heart, which was the living source of these flames. (laughs) Okay, unpack that for us, because that's big. I have have an image. (laughs) So Caitlin is a painter, and... Tell us about this image. This is gorgeous. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, the Divine Mercy is um, me. I added that. Yeah. There's a link between Divine Mercy and the Sacred Heart, which is a whole other theological topic. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like his wounds are burning with love for us. Like he yeah. loves us so much that there's nothing he wouldn't have done to draw us to himself. Yeah. And then it's, it's they're burning with love, but also with that pain and that longing. And I think it goes back to that, like on the cross when he says, I thirst. 
yeah. and to see that fire, see that fire and to, like hear that at the same, same time like this flame is almost is consuming him even though it doesn't though it consume does anything else that, else that it touches wow geez the that's a, a powerful image and to think that the wound is the place of fire you know like mm-hmm. it's it's you know, the heart is wounded and it's on fire, you know, and stuff. And so it's not even, not even our sinfulness, not even his wounds, not even what nailed him there can, you know, put that out. It's, it's still a flame for us. It's still burning for us. It's still, you know, it's, um, to think of his heart and his wounds burning for us, (laughs) You know, not just his thirst from the cross, but like that actual flame and, and how he wants that, you know, for us to know that and uh, and us to understand that, you know, about his heart. Ooh. When did you paint that? Um, that's a good that's question. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, I think so. I yeah. think it was right after I first read this. Really? Because, because yeah. yeah. Like I was inspired by that image and I always wanted to do something stained glassy. And if that it's on plastic, so if I angle it right on the light, it does look like the fire is actually burning. Really? Yeah, I love it. I love it. Jeez. Okay, so the visions. Um this heart that uh is burning and the work that he kind of did in her and the wounds it wasn't it his um i know in uh with joseph he would reveal people oops, sorry <laughs> reveal um what his visions were to bring out okay i want you to spread this devotion but also to have her to join in the suffering. What mm-hmm. was kind of the, what was kind of the aim, the real central kind of thing when he would speak to her? Was it I want you to spread this devotion? But was it around suffering or? I think it was more like he wanted her to be a witness. Mm-hmm. So like more her person. And she wasn't. She talks a lot about how she's not allowed to speak about her sufferings. And there's this value in suffering silently as he did. Mm-hmm. And also, like she, I don't remember if there's a point where she does try to talk about them or if that's a different saint. But she finds the, like no satisfaction in actually talking about these sufferings. But there's somehow this joy in just remaining closer to Jesus in the silence. Wow. Which in some moods, I understand that, but sometimes it sounds really weird to me. (laughs) (laughs) It's next level, right? I mean, Uh you know, I think going back to that point that you said about that spousal union, um, I think when you have that intimacy with your spouse that you find uh, when they know when you're suffering. They know when you're going through hardship. And you don't even have to speak, you know. I know and 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 um with my husband, you know, it's, it can just be that they just see you when they know, right? You know, like what's going on, you know. So it's almost like growing into that of understanding that you have that oneness and union with them and they know of your suffering and it, you don't even really need to speak of it um, to be consoled or understood, you know, but it takes a while to get there. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you just do want to complain. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> I complained to Jesus a lot. <laughs> It's when that canonized. <laughs> You're also still alive, so. <laughs> but I think if everyone to complain to, he's the best one, right? Because 
Yeah, but it's like, like with Margaret Mary, there were a lot of times when she would complain only to him, but he didn't console her the way that I think most people would go to Jesus looking for consolation. Really? It's more like he reminds her that he's giving her the grace to endure what she's going through and with her. And because she is suffering, she's united to him. Yeah. I think I talked about this a little bit in my last post about is it just introducing the sacred heart theme? Yeah. But it's like in our suffering, that's when we're most closely united with Jesus's heart. Yeah. And if you look at his heart, it's pierced open and pouring out with love for us. It's on fire. It's, it's like, it doesn't have a crown. It's crowned with the cross, which is an instrument of torture. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And this it's, is just like, this is how God shows us that he loves us. <laughs> right, right. The mystery of the cross, right? Mm-hmm. The paradox of that. Yeah, I, I think that the, um, with suffering and that union, it's what you said, you know, in terms of consolation, I think is important for us to, to understand, you know, and stuff is that I think we have an idea of what consolation is and Christ has a different idea necessarily right sometimes yeah (laughs) i mean his was more to just say i'm with you right like it Mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily i'm not going to take this away from you yeah um but i'm i'm with you in this right Mm -hmm. yeah that we're not suffering alone yeah there's also like it's almost that we're consoling him and his suffering when we suffer Mm -hmm. because like, we are not alone in our suffering, but also because we're suffering, he's not alone. Yeah. Yeah, that's a huge theme um, with Josepha. Did he talk a lot about, you know, like, comforting, like, c- consoling his heart with her? Or what was his... I don't remember if he talked about that specifically, but there's that most famous vision mm-hmm. where he's showing her his heart. Yeah. And he says, he behold his heart, heart, which has which loved has men so much that it has spared nothing, nothing, even to exhausting and consuming itself, in order to testify to them its love. And in return, I receive from the greater number nothing but ingratitude by reason of their irreverence and sacrileges, and by the coldness and contempt which they show me in the sacrament of love. But what I feel most keenly is that it is hearts which are consecrated to me that treat me thus. And that's, see, that's usually where people end the quote, but he goes on to say, therefore, I ask of thee that the Friday after the octave of Corpus Christi be set apart for a special feast to honor my heart by communicating on that day and making reparation to it by a solemn act. So this, like, this is the most famous vision of the sacred heart and that's the image that we're used to but like i didn't realize until i was rereading this that this is also when he calls for (laughs) this feast of the sacred heart to be instituted right now yes (laughs) we had corpus for those that are watching this later we had corpus christi sunday yesterday and he said at the last part of this he said what for her to do what during right now to have the feast in honor of his sacred heart on the Friday after the Octave of Corpus Christi. Which is this Friday, June 24th. <laughs> also my wedding anniversary, guys. So I mean, talk about the, the union of spouses, right? It's the first time it'll ever be on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. It never has been before. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. right. So we did not, we'd like to think that we planned it, that we would give this talk during the octave. We did not. (laughs) God kind of allowed us to have a happy accident there, right? Yeah, it was more that I just wanted to go last. (laughs) (laughs) Right? (laughs) That's great. Wow. So he asked for this special feast mm-hmm. and, and so he wanted us to honor and celebrate it. 
And and then there's also the promises that he gave, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you are still here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I don't remember where he gives the promises. I know they're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's 12 promises and yeah, there's 12 of them. And we won't be able to get into all of it. We won't be able to really get into that. But the beauty of the of these 12 promises, you know, of, of him revealing this, it, it's kind of like him calling us, right, to have that devotion and him saying, when you do, I will bless and give you all these graces um, by honoring my sacred heart, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're kind of like incentives, so to speak, right? A little, but bit, it's, a little bit. Yeah. But it's like just to abundantly bless all that because he just, he wants our love. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. some of them are common sense because isn't it? Like it's basically if you honor his sacred heart, you're going to be with him in eternity, which makes sense because... Like, if you're spending time with God on earth, if he's the only thing that you desire on earth, then that's the choice you can make at the point of death. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, exactly. So, we'll be sharing more about the 12 um, promises shortly and uh, on the blog more. Um, but they're also, you know, something that you can check out um, online is... Uh, search for the 12 promises i've covered some of it on our blog before um in the blogs about the sacred heart uh, specifically the one that says all we need is in his heart but it's kind of just a a summary of the 12 promises of you know him saying that he wants us to um first friday um to, to you know go to consecutive masses on first friday you know to honor his heart to place uh, a picture of his heart that he will specially bless um, our homes if we have you know a picture of his heart in our homes and um, things of that nature of all you know for for us to to spread the devotion really is like for each one of these things that you do then uh, if you consecrate yourself I will not you know I'll I will bless your endeavors I will do this and so it's him kind of just saying you know, how he wishes to pour out more love and more grace and more upon us, the more that we draw ourselves deeper into it, because the the heart is, is what it's a, it's a, it's a sign of. What's the center of the person. person. Yeah. I think I remember remember, I back in Jewish culture, I think it was even more more significant than that. that. But you were talking to, yeah, about for Jesus himself. <laughs> right, right. And the Eucharistic connection, right? Yes. Right? Yeah, because there's also, I think with all the saints who Jesus called to spread devotion to the Sacred Heart, it's like they have this strong Eucharistic devotion. Yeah. And that's where this, this love of the Sacred Heart comes out. And that's also how I stumbled into the Sacred Heart. Because I used to think it was a really weird devotion. Like, yeah. What? We are Catholics so excited about Jesus' heart. Why can't it be inside his body? (laughs) (laughs) So you came to know his heart through the Eucharist then? Yes. What was that like? Uh, Accidental. (laughs) (laughs) I was little. And I used to say, like, we lift up our hearts. I didn't want to give him my heart. (laughs) No, I, you can't live without your heart. You could have a kidney, and I could live without that. Or I live without lung. But I need my heart to survive. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a change of heart that happened, I guess, and yeah. somewhere in there, right? Like that's. I think that's one of the things I love about Margaret Mary is like I see a lot of my own reluctance in her. She's much more obedient to her reluctance than I am. <laughs> But she was transformed also, right, through through the through all of this with the Lord. I mean, did he kind of change her reluctance or did she always carry that? Because I know Joseph uh, always struggled. I don't know so much if he changed it. I know like at first she really struggled with obedience. Yeah. And then it gets to the point where she it's obedient, but she's still struggling to do the thing. I think it would be agony for her if she didn't, because like she's so completely united with Jesus' heart that 
to deny to his deny will, will is like to deny to a part of herself. Wow. And I think that's what he he knows about, you know, her, why he chose her, right? Is that, right, you, you're reluctant and you struggle, which is our humanness. And that I know that you still will be obedient. I know you still will do it. And I know that it'll be a mortification. And I think it's part of... It was part of her sanctification, right? Mm-hmm. Of having to overcome her will and having to overcome her reluctance and having to overcome being seen and known in these ways. But it took a while, right? You said it wasn't immediately that her writings became known. She never wanted to be known. Like yeah. she, she wrote her autobiography out of obedience and then she burned it because she thought she'd done the obedient thing. <laughs> <laughs> then her spiritual director told her that she wasn't just supposed to write it. They wanted a record. <laughs> Oops. So she had to rewrite the whole thing. And it, like it was, she talks about how it was agony the first time she had to write it. Oh, I can't imagine the second time because there's points where she's, like, she's talking to Jesus as she's writing. And it's like, Lord, why are you making me remember this? It's agonizing to remember this. And it doesn't, like, from my perspective, it seems like this is such a little thing to be so agonized over. But I think it's also that hindsight. Like, when we look back at things we did when we were 12. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't think that was a good idea. Yeah, thinking thinking of it, I mean, if I lost a blog post, I'd be pretty upset. Losing the entire, you know, burning the entire book and then realizing I have to write it again. <laughs> I'm going to need a few days to work through this. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, so I want to be able to get some of our questions here. So what do you want to leave us with before we get to that? I noted, like, with all of the saints, that it's, like, their sense of unworthiness and their sense of their own sin, like, weighs so heavily upon them. But it's, like, Jesus chooses the little saints and makes them big. And it's, like, exactly in that empty of ourselves that we make room for him to take up that throne in our hearts. Yeah. I mean, it, it's so in line with our mission, right? You know, <laughs> little with great love, you know, I mean that the little saints then allow him to kind of, I mean, he, he wants to do that. He wants to say, I've chosen you because you are little and I want to show my glory through you. So that there'll be like no mistake, <laughs> you know, that it's me because you're not capable of doing this. You're right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she was well aware of that about yeah, herself. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think that's also like one of the beautiful, beautiful things about these saints is that they are so, they are so humble, humble. Yeah. and so, so aware of their unworthiness, but it's not like, it's not like self-deprecating. self-deprecating. Yeah. The true knowledge of how unworthy they are before God. Yeah. And, and, like being in being awe that he is choosing them for this mission. mission. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a difference in that, like you said, you know, of having that humility of that true understanding of, of who they are in God's eyes and to Mm -hmm. to realize his greatness and their unworthiness uh, to be chosen. And, and, and none of us are worthy, right? (laughs) None of us, (laughs) but it's like, they realize extra, extra. They're just like, no. You know, just humility, humility obedience. Yes. That's yes. pretty much all Jesus has for. Oh, now that I say that, never pray for humility and obedience. <laughs> <laughs> I think when we meet, you talk to me about you ask me to pray for that for you. <laughs> when I pray for it for myself, it doesn't go well. <laughs> I don't know that it goes any better. And say, I don't know that it goes any better when I ask for it for you either, but <laughs> yeah, the core two of these things, right, is uh, mm-hmm. that humility that Christ shows and drawing us back into, you know, do what I ask, you know, and I love when Father Mike Schmidt says, you know, we do it because he asks, uh, you know, we do it 
we do it because he asks and we do it how, you know, how he asks us to do it and because he wants us to do it. And that's rewriting a book after you burned it up. That's, you know? It's like, I never told you to do that in the first place. <laughs> that's on you. Right? Yeah. Well, I also like, I don't think it entered into her mind that anybody would actually care to read about her life. <laughs> this little saint in France in a monastery. Like, who's going to care about her years later? <laughs> right. And so you started off by saying you had this aversion to French saints a bit. How did that change by getting to know her? You just you know what it comes. <laughs> it is, it's that like that draw to his heart. I think that's what draws us together as Christians. Because when we're moving closer to his heart, we're moving closer to each other. Absolutely. Right. Because of that unity that he's all drawing us there. And we're all brought together in love. Right. It's that same thing he prayed for in Gethsemane. Mm. That'll be one. That's like, a, do you have your mic? <laughs> you can't drop it. It's all right. So let's see what we have here. Um, we have Albert um, from Malta that said, Did Jesus request? through her for France to be consecrated to the sacred heart of Jesus. I don't think so. Not that I remember in my reading and not when I was looking through it again. I think it was more like he was asking for reparation for sins against his heart. And I know like with the other saints and with Margaret Mary, he talked about how it's the sins of religious who claim to be acting in his name that hurt his heart the most. Yeah. So it's more... Like individuals, individuals offering reparation for the sins, sins of others. others. Yeah. Okay. So not necessarily France, but the whole world, right? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we we can fact check that and, and see. But <laughs> and there's the same, yeah, with Josepha as well, and it was saying that the religious hurt him the most, and, mm-hmm. and you know, and, and he was asking for reparations, so. I think he said that to Zena, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, so is it, uh, I hope I'm saying it right, Valletta, right? Here in Valletta, in, in Malta. Um, St. Paul's Parish this Friday will be a celebration of the Sacred Heart followed by a procession with the Blessed Sacrament to the main streets of the capital, accompanied by a band playing sacred music. Oh, oh Wow. Caitlin wants to go to Malta this weekend. <laughs> that sounds like such a beautiful celebration. I I don't know of, of anything like that happening here. What about you? Cause Caitlin, I'm in Austin, Texas. Caitlin's up in Indiana. Not for Sacred Heart, but I think all around the country there were processions in Corpus Christi. Yeah, yeah. You had a big Corpus Christi procession that you just did yesterday, right? And it yeah. wasn't hot. I was expecting it to be like 100 degrees, and it wasn't. <laughs> did they do music? Burning up in the furnace of his heart. <laughs> right. Did they do music there or no? Uh, we sang. Did you? But there wasn't like a band playing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that sounds like an amazing um, celebration. So pray... Pray for us. Uh, pray for this devotion uh, to be spread. You know, when you're there, Albert, that'd be awesome. What's your one takeaway on on um, Margaret Mary for us? What would be the one thing that you want us to really kind of take into our own spiritual, like maybe something that really struck you, struck your heart, something that could kind of speak to ours to take forward from our time here? Oh, yeah, I'll just read it. So Margaret Mary, she's worried that her actions are not in accord with what she's saying to Jesus. And she's afraid to say that she loves him. And she says, my heart yearns to love him and to perform all my actions through obedience. Though as I knew not how to practice either the one or the other, I thought it was a sin to say that I loved because my actions contradicted my words. Really? 
Wow. She's still she's conscious, conscious of, of like her words, her words being, being in accordance with what she's, what doing. she's doing. And that's so much she's like, so much like she's as the as word, word, like everything, everything he says is in accord with everything that he is. Wow. So even with her level of holiness, she still was so aware. Um, mm-hmm. She was afraid to tell Jesus that she loved him, even though it's clear from her writing that she loved him very much. <laughs> I never think of, I guess, I guess maybe it's taken for granted that you could just tell him that you love him. Mm-hmm. But I think she's so aware of the word and the action and the attention all following through with that, mm-hmm. which I think a lot of us maybe don't consider. Mm-hmm. And when you okay. see, like, when, you when you're see, constantly you're aware, aware of his, his love, love for, us, for us, then to then say, say you love him love back to that love, love that you've received, received, like, that's different. different. Because, 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 like, there's times when I look at the tabernacle and think, Lord, I love you. But it's, like, my love can never be anything close to what his love is. And it's only when I let him love through me that I'm truly loving another person. That's it. That's that's the takeaway right there. <laughs> that's the one because it, it's so true. I mean, his love is is the only thing, right? I mean, that's what we have to give, and that's when it's at its best form is when we can love with his love, um, which comes from his heart. Alyssa dropped something over here, which is great reminder. Um, as we wrap uh, and draw this to a close, our time that uh, we have a special uh, promo code. Um, our, we have a lot of Sacred Heart stuff in our shop. We have hoodies and hats and bags and um, more artwork from Caitlin in our shop. The beautiful. Um, there's a pillow. Yeah, I like my yeah <laughs> pillow that I did. We're both artists. I do watercolor. You do acrylic, right? And, in, and there's yeah. a link to the shop there. Um, oh, and uh, let's see what Albert said. He did a follow-up comment here. So he just checked on Google search, and it seems that Jesus requested the king of France to consecrate his realm and himself to his sacred heart. Uh, from memory, I believe he did not act upon it. But the consequence, France was later invaded and defeated by the Germans. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Let this be a lesson, boys and girls. <laughs> if Jesus says to do it, you best do it. <laughs> Even the king of France would not get off the hook from that one. Holy cow. I did not know that. That's a That's a really unbelievable story mm-hmm. well we both learned something so yeah. thank you <laughs> <laughs> the beauty here of the internet <laughs> get back to us <laughs> thank you for sharing that with us that's a um it's a really cool fact uh, that window right now between corpus christi and, and sacred heart uh, this friday so i'd say we all have a great opportunity um, these books that we've been basing our talks on you know they're all available um you know online amazon tan books you know a lot of these different um, sellers have them um so that one to, not that not that big of a read. It's something that you can kind of take into your prayer time and be able to kind of, yeah, right there. Autobiography. (laughs) (laughs) Rewritten copy. Uh, And this is the last of our talks. So our other talks are available on our YouTube. They're also available on our website. Um, And we'd love to stay in touch with you guys. So we hope that you'll connect with us on Facebook, on Instagram, um, that we're uh, here on Crowdcast. You can subscribe for our future talks. Um, and we'd love to, you know, stay in touch with you. So it's been such a blessing, you know, for us to be able to get to talk about his heart during the month of the sacred heart. And it's really what our, um, ministry is consecrated to. Um, so obviously you see it in our little logo, the, the sacred heart right in the middle of it. And the sacred heart is what drew Caitlin, uh, to our ministry as well. So you can find, tell them where they can find you on, um, Insta and on the internet. It's hard to say good heart. heart. Yeah. (laughs) So easy right there. (laughs) Um, We're really blessed. We're going to 
Should we just kind of close up in here in a prayer? You think? Sure. Yeah. You want, you want to? Or you want... Yeah, you got one? I do. They're in the back of the book. They're in the back of the book. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. This is a prayer this to St. Margaret Mary. Saint Mary. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O oh, Saint Margaret oh, Mary, Mary, permitted by the Sacred Heart of Jesus to, to become partaker of its divine treasures, divine treasures. obtain for us, obtain we for be us from, that from that adorable heart the graces that, the graces that we need. We ask for them we with boundless confidence. confidence. May, the May the divine heart be willing to grant them to us through thy intercession, so that once again so once it may through the evening be glorified and loved. Amen. 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 Well, thanks so much. Thanks for sharing uh, St. Margaret Mary tonight with us. Thank you for uh, being with us here on the journey through this month. And thank you guys for showing up tonight. And thanks, Alyssa, for keeping us going and Albert as well. And those of you guys that will watch this later, what a blessing. So.